All right, everyone, I'm very happy to welcome you to this uh, open innovation session. There are, you can get 1.25 AIA and AICP credits for this course. The AIA sheets are in the back to sign up. AICP are self-reporting. Um, and we will start with Greg Weatherspoon. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we see as a, a need out there for a typology of housing that uh, developers are really interested in right now. In fact, I just got my hands on a brand new study that was done for Greenville uh, looking at trying to uh, validate a paradigm of creating a for rent single family housing project. Greenville, South Carolina? That's correct. That's where I'm from. Hey, fantastic. All right. Well, maybe you'll get it. I can't share the report with you, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to start off with just a little bit of uh, demographics. I know everybody has seen a lot of this, but uh, I want to focus specifically on Gen Y and why this could be an important typology moving forward in the next decade for Gen Y. If you take a look at uh, Gen Y, one of the big deals is that they're in debt, heavily in debt. And when you think about uh, this, this slide here just represents the federal student loan debt. It doesn't even uh, represent private uh, debt out there for uh, folks that are coming out of college right now. So the reality is, is that developing enough equity to put 20% down on a purchase price is a long ways off for a huge portion of the Gen Y population. So what does that lead to? It leads to a new norm in terms of renting. These slides are from uh, John Burns Real Estate uh, Consulting Company, and uh, they are brand new. I mean, it's from January 2012. And so you can see the projection in terms of both rental as well as the drop in uh, home ownership. And houses are getting smaller. And don't let this slide fool you. If you look at the, the far right, 2010 to 2015, it's not that steep of a drop. And the reality is, is that 2100 is still a, a fairly big house, but the trend is going down. And here's the conundrum. If you look at what people want to live in across the board, from Eisenhower's to Gen Y, if you ask what their preference is, the preference is, is, is by and large, uh, single family uh, typologies. And you can see that the Gen Y, they increase substantially above Gen X in terms of looking at apartments and condos. But by and large, everybody would still prefer a single family lifestyle. So the idea is to not just get smaller, but do it right. And so, you know, our design concept is uh, designing from the furniture out. Uh, you know, we've, we've gotten a lot of pressure in the development world just to make the box smaller, but we tore that model up and we said, let's start from the inside and start from where you sit to where you actually move and, and work and play. And uh, the, the, this particular home here, you can see it's, it's set up to actually be a nice quadplex if you wanted to, based on this corner right there. But it doesn't have a lawn, it's got two courtyards, and it still has uh, two cars uh, in the garage. You need spaces for everyday living. You need to make it flexible, uh, simple, affordable, uh, rectilinear. You can see it's a nice box. It does have two stories. The front porch leads out to a courtyard here. Uh, but there's no lawn to mow. Uh, but there is, very importantly, ample storage. Curb appeal, you want to get the proportions right. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And it's, it's really about the quality of the space over the, the quantity of the space. Um, and Living outside, the courtyards, the indoor-outdoor relationship is crucial, uh, as well as daylighting. So there's, there's a lot of use of, of clear story windows and higher small windows to bring light in in multiple locations. So when you get tight, you still have the, the privacy, but you're bringing in light from above. Simple, pleasing proportions, as I said. You can, you can really do a lot without a whole bunch of ornamentation. Um, you know, using paint to create interest, um, avoiding unnecessary architectural elements, and perhaps even thinking about grouped parking and not even having a garage. So these are some of our ideas. We, we produced these for a client recently. This is a studio apartment. This one is, is another one bedroom typology that works well, and, or two bedroom typology that works well in terms of kind of a cottage format. You can see that uh, we've talked to some people about actually cr getting creative in terms of the way you put these things together. This one is a, a quadplex opportunity. 
This is actually a, another opportunity for a three bedroom, uh, which is actually uh, a preferred model. When you start to look at the percentages of studio versus two bedroom versus three bedroom in a, in a four rent, a single family model, the two and three bedrooms actually far outweigh the need for the studios. This one's kind of fun. We call this a paired home. This is actually two homes where this front one, the entry is right here, and then you've got a two story building. You have a nice little courtyard. You get back to a one-story garage. This one, the entry is right here through a gate. You can see the gate over in this location. And then you get to the front porch right here, and then they have a, a tandem garage back in this location here. So you can really start to get a lot of density when you start to uh, pair these up and, and look at creative ways of making duplexes and triplexes. Another one, this is about as big as we're looking at. It's 1,800 square feet in a four rental model, but it's on a 21 foot four plate. So it's very, very skinny, very tight. And of course you can see how it can duplex up nicely. Some of the elevations, we're trying to get a little more creative with the Gen Y, getting away from some of the traditional stuff and looking at something that's a little bit more fun and more contemporary, whether that's in a, a, a nice, smooth, clean Mediterranean style or something done with a lot of fun and color and paint and, you know, there's, there's no shutters on this. You've got the nice shade structures. This is a little bit more traditional um, for a different client, but uh, this one down here is actually one building with six units in it. Oh, sorry, all attached with, uh, attached here at the garage or the garage in the back in this location. And this is actually single family residential up here. It's, it's separated, but they're still very tightly spaced. Then starting to take a look at what a neighborhood might look like. So this layout here, it's really important that you have the open space managed. Um, you know, one of the things about Gen Y is they, they really don't want to accumulate a lot of things. And one of the things that they don't want, just like baby boomers, is they don't want a lawnmower. So when you start to take a look at what these developments need, they need to be well managed, but they need to be very comfortable. They need to live like a single family house in a very tight location. They need to be well managed. And in this location, we actually did get rid of the garages. We grouped the garages over here. And you can really start to get quite a bit of density. Notice you still have ample parking in front of the homes as well. Then the alley condition here, looking at uh, that, that, uh, the earlier model that I showed you, you can see how you can duplex these up and have an alley uh, condition here, really tight spaces in between the homes. But this is, this is pushing in somewhere around 12 to 13 units an acre, depending on what your setbacks are in between the homes. Getting a little bit more creative, mixing up some duplex options with uh, single family options and then having a parking court so that you can actually bring some parking into the interior where you've got uh, two studios connected, then a couple larger homes here, the, the duplex condition, and then a, a true single family location over here. Nice, tight, small, skinny streets, really important to keep the density up. This one here uh, is a, a, similar look, a similar condition, but we've added a nice little park space to where, uh, you know, you've got a place to play, kind of becomes everybody's front yard, if you will. It's a mix of alleys and some front loads. Um, the whole idea is that once you figure out what your mix is in terms of uh, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, whether you have studios or not, try to mix it and match it so that it's not, you know, two bedrooms over here and three bedrooms over there. Really think carefully about how you're site planning these things. And this is the, the last slide. I'm going to be really brief. Uh, but uh, this one is, is getting really creative with, with all these interior courtyards. All of these are kind of attached in one way or another except for the, the street that's in the middle. And uh, we're actually getting 15 units an acre with this type of of development and um, we've really gotten some interest in terms of, of putting this together. So with that, I will Thank move you. on. All right, next up we have a tri-pack of incremental sprawl repair. While I'm getting the first one launched, could you uh, three guys introduce yourselves for the incremental sprawl repair? Yep, I'm Neil Heller from Table Arkansas. I'm Brian Peake, Bob Sharp. Great. All right, here's the first of the three. And you guys have 20 minutes together, okay. so I'm leaving it to you to manage it unless you want that? me to flag you. Do you want me to give you a seven-minute flag? Or Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll give you a one-minute oh. warning before seven minutes. Okay. Hey. Control. <laughs> 
Is L the one next to the K? Fantastic, thanks. Well, Neil Heller, like I said, and this is my Chupacabra style presentation uh, at CNU 20. Uh, many people say that sprawl repair will be the work of the next generation, but that takes money. And in a time when money, there is no money and lending is tight, what do you do? You do incremental sprawl repair. It allows us creative types to continue with repair, uh, but more importantly, it includes non-designer members of the public uh, to contribute to creating good urbanism. And so I'd like to initially share uh, some of the tools, techniques, and tenants that we've come up with so far, and then Brian will come after me, share you uh, some affordable infrastructure ideas, and then uh, Robert Sharp, architect, will uh, share some of the prototypes. So the ultimate pioneer of incremental sprawl repair is the mobile food vendor. Uh, this is a low investment, low risk business incubator, and collectively they combine to create uh, a streetscape and they camouflage parking lots, uh, turning a dead space into a humane habitable space uh, when people are where people want to be, they attract other people. So ultimately, uh, the traffic generated from food carts supports micro-retail as a viable option. Uh, micro-retail could be considered maybe uh, phase two of incremental sprawl repair. Uh, the introduction of permanent structures. Uh, you can even see that some graffiti artist really likes this concept as well. I love you so much. <laughs> So while these images are not really in sprawl, as you can tell, but they are representative of a technique that could be used uh, in the excessive setbacks of a sprawling monocultural single-family uh, subdivision. And then this would provide needs and services to residences within walking distance. So while the business model of corporate entities relies on car traffic volume, uh, the local business does not necessarily need to. Uh, once an area is established as a place for people, a local manufacturer makes for a good tenant to supply desired goods and services. And so the bread display there on the right is in the entry foyer of a vacated bank. Create a patio. Uh, incrementally is the way that we have built cities for thousands of years. Uh, it's what gives a place that crunchy, that graininess of character. Uh, and so many of the places that we have today had very humble beginnings. Uh, if you consider the Ponte Vecchio, in uh, Florence, Italy, that was originally a butcher's row. Uh, now it's a world-class destination. Use low-tech materials. Using and reusing low-tech materials can help create an eclectic, uh, organic, human-scaled space. It should not cost a lot to incrementally repair a place. I mean, that's the whole idea behind all of this. It shouldn't break the bank. And so, oh, you can see somebody's using a pallet. I mean, that's genius. It's free wood. Uh, build a wall. A simple item such as a low wall can provide separation and screening for pedestrians from parking lots. Again, the idea is to generate human activity. Uh, people attract people, thus transforming a space into a more humane environment. Uh, the wall can be low uh, and simple or it could be elaborately detailed, but what matters is that verticality at the back of the sidewalk that offers that legibility of perceived use. Bicycle, this guy here on the left wanted to show me how fun it was to ride bikes. But who was it that said that the invention of the bicycle was the high point of human development? But millions of people around the world use a bicycle as a completely viable form of transportation. A uh, bicycle is human scaled, therefore the results of designing to accommodate the bike will be human scaled. Uh, accommodating bicycle parking is a great way to manage underutilized space on city streets. Friends of Trees hauls all tools, all people, and material by bicycle. In their first year, they planted 5,000 new trees. These trees were planted street side where there are none, and in sprawling, low density areas, many times between freeways and neighborhoods. Uh, this encourages walkability, uh, reduces air pollution, increases health, and it beautifies the well traveled transportation corridor. Underpass Park. See, the highway departments have been on a road building orgy for 50 or more years now, uh, slicing through and decimating neighborhoods. And where this has happened, we can utilize this dead space under an overpass, and this can act as a way of bringing certain members of an area together, uh, as well as providing an interesting link from one side to the other. And I just want to point something out here, uh, that the one on the, the image on the left, that unauthorized the skaters, not the city, not the planners, transformed this lot full of garbage into a prospering place. Co-housing. Uh, Co-housing increases density, variety, and affordability in a monoculture of housing. Uh, by building an accessory dwelling unit and finishing out a garage, this project that you see here was able to offer a $135,000 unit in a neighborhood where most of the homes were $300,000. 
recycled concrete wall. I think there's something very poetic about this image here. Uh, we're using what uh, it makes a place ugly and inhospitable, and now it's something nice and cute. Narrow the streets. Uh, narrowing the streets slows the traffic and increases space for pedestrians. Uh, one way to do that and benefit the ecology is to use street narrowing bioswales. So narrow the street, slow the traffic, then comes the bikes and the pedestrians, and then comes a place. And sorry, I don't mean to simplify it too much. I only have 20 seconds. <laughs> so by popping in a simple bike through window to serve up waffles, this blank wall that you see here has become a destination. Uh, this tiny business sits behind a larger restaurant and bar, and it does not require any parking. Uh, this can lead to a space frequented by residents and passerbys. Uh, but this is such a cheap uh, idea, but the rewards are tremendous. And so this is definitely a low-cost, high-value technique. So plants in movable pots. Uh, one of the simplest ways to define space and add a bit of foliage to a place is to add plants in movable pots. And this is a technique that requires small initial investment, uh, but it's one of the best ways to indicate that an area is moving from worthless strip space to human-centered space. Uh, in this harsh world of worn-out sprawl, uh, you could conceive of potted plants as the advance guard. So depave, depave, depave. Uh, this sprawling strip mall parking lot was getting depaved in order to install street trees and a sidewalk. You know, this country is so overparked. Uh, there's actually a nonprofit group called Depave. Uh, Depave.org offers ideas on how to reconnect urban landscapes to nature through the reduction of pavement. Repurpose vacant space. This is an amazing parking lot art show in an old motor lodge. Uh, this art show is complete with fixie bike bling contest. You guys know what fixie is? Yeah. All right. It had kid art and tasty beer, not kid tasty beer. Each room in the motel was open to a different artist display of their work. And so you kind of went around to each room, and each artist had somewhat of their own private space. So organizing a community event can be done by any group of individuals. These events support local businesses. They attract crowds. One minute. Let's move on. <laughs> Co-working space. The age of the plush furniture in the corner office, uh, that has given way to, to spaces that are flexible, open, Let's move on. So I want to enjoy, invite you to join us in this conversation. Uh, and I want to kind of wrap it up here with this quote that cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they're created by everybody. And so not to just show up at presentations and talk about neat ideas, but we have actually found a little bit of an area that we can try, kind of our test lab, to try these ideas out. And this is phase one where we have implemented here these uh, pioneers of incremental sprawl repair. Thank you. Rolls-Royce. This is a Rolls-Royce that uh, I saw on Worth Avenue in, in Palm Beach uh, the other day. And it, it reminded me, it made me think of, you know, when the city is requiring infrastructure of, of private developers, I think this is a lot of times, this is, this is what they expect. It makes it difficult um, to implement some of the sprawl retrofit plans that I, that I want to quickly uh, try, to, try to show you. Uh, after I show you those, I want to also try to show you some construction methods and materials uh, that we've developed as alternatives to the, to the Rolls-Royce infrastructure. This is a block retrofit, um, existing streets, existing infrastructure, uh, 14 quarter acre lots. The retrofit plan has, the, ret the retrofit plan has, we turned it into 22 uh, smaller units with, by adding a central cottage court and two parking courts. Uh, the the city required infrastructure on this retrofit plan was estimated at twelve thousand dollars per per additional unit. This is a hillside retrofit plan. It's fifty large lots that that are not selling. Uh, we put together a, a retrofit plan that added cottage courts, pedestrian ways, alleyways, uh, pub, a hilltop public green space, and we tripled the density. 
Uh, the city right required infrastructure for this plan was um, about $15,000 per additional unit. Connect the cul-de-sac. This is three dead-end cul-de-sacs. Uh, the retrofit plan connected two of them. Uh, a, a third one was terminated, in, terminated into a um, proposed community building. But the cost of the city streets that went with this plan, um, you know, it raised a lot of concern for the feasibility of the project. This is not a, a retrofit plan, but it is an infill project uh, that we're working on. And it created, created the, the opportunity for us to look at, look at doing an infrastructure affordability overlay or simply identifying construction methods and materials to help reduce the cost of the, of the city required infrastructure. Uh, and what we found is that, that these methods have given us the potential to save approximately 25 to 30 percent of our site, site improvement cost on our, on our projects. The first method, narrow the street. If you can reduce the lane widths on your streets down to eight feet where appropriate, you might save 15 to 25 percent of the paving cost. Uh, additional health, safety, and environmental benefits go along with that. If you're successful at reducing the streets down to eight foot lanes, you might just consider a shared street. Um, that would give you the opportunity to remove the cost of, of putting in a sidewalk. You might consider different paving materials, maybe chip and seal pavement. Uh, it's 25% the cost of asphalt pavement. It also has the um, added benefits of pot potentially creating some traffic calming. Some people uh, might like the, the aesthetic that a chip and seal pavement provides. Uh, use alter alternative sidewalk materials. Uh, at Poundberry, they were using chip and seal sidewalks. Uh, other less traveled sidewalks, you might consider gravel or sand or another less expensive material. For parallel parking on your streets, you might consider gravel. Uh, this is going to reduce your paving costs. It's also going to help the storm water to infiltrate into the, into the ground. Uh, you might just remove the curb and gutter. Uh, let the storm water uh, run off into the grass. Let the grass filter the storm water. Hopefully that's, a lot of that storm water can infiltrate uh, into the ground. Or if you're planning for a sidewalk next to your, right next to your street without a green space, you might just eliminate the curb altogether and do a, a turndown sidewalk, which is going to save you a significant amount of money. Uh, instead of the, the, the um, curb tree islands, you know, why not just eliminate that curb and let the water get to the trees? A gravel parking court, you know, instead of an asphalt curb and gutter parking lot, you might uh, use gravel and create an aesthetically beautiful parking court that you know, people might just enjoy being in. Um, in the alleyways, the less traveled uh, streets, you might as well use gravel. Why would you, you know, why would, in most situations, residential situations, why would you pave an alley with, with concrete? Or you might not even use alleys at all. How about shared driveways? Um, there's, I've visited many neighborhoods where block after block, you know, they, they didn't even have shared driveways or alleys. They just utilized on-street parking. Uh, most cities require, when you're building streets, require you to, to excavate three feet to uh, install all the subgrade material for, for their standard streets. This isn't always required. Uh, why not do a soles testing and, and decide, you know, what specifically is needed uh, for, for your your site. Uh, city, the cities usually require eight inch minimum water lines. Well, why not? Why would you put in an eight inch water line if, if you only need a four or a six inch water line? You're going to save a significant amount of, amount of money. So design the water lines and put in what you need. Use graded inlets instead of the big curb inlets. Uh, the graded inlets are about half the, the, the storm box that goes with the graded inlets are usually about half the cost of the storm box that goes with the curb inlets. Uh, it, they're better for water quality uh, and they're, they're safer for pedestrians. Uh, the last, last method, use overhead utilities where, where you think it might be appropriate. Um, we, we pay the utility companies a premium uh, to put our utilities underground. You can save a, a lot of money uh, if, if you are okay with overhead utilities. So that's it. Uh, that's the last method. I don't have time for questions, but um, 
Anyway, that we've all those methods together could potentially save you 25 to 30 percent of your site improvement cost. If we stay on, if all the speakers stay on time, we will have time for some discussion. Okay. Um, a lot of discussions this week have been about uh, coding and corridor retrofits and the political work that has to be done. We've also talked a lot about the tactical things which have to be done. Those are both uh, very important uh, things that we've got to take on. The other thing that we've got to do at a certain point is begin to build uh, built fabric. And uh, that's done primarily by uh, private sector developers. And so we have to find a way in this economy where we are cash strapped to actually get some real buildings up. The first thing is to really understand who the tenants are going to be of these buildings. You know, it's not going to be the uh, conventional commercial real estate tenants. Certainly there'll be some of those. But the people that, that need the space, the space that's not available are the budding entrepreneurs, the uh, uh, investors, residents, the people that, that are, are needing the space. We really need to understand what they need in terms of affordability, flexibility, visibility, access, and security. And so we've developed on the Incremental Sprawl Working Group, we've been working quite a while to develop new building types or re, re, uh, rediscover old building types that will work in sprawl. And to go quickly through these, the new types have to be incremental. You have to be able to build them one at a time. You can't build fast projects. They've got to be affordable. They've got to look decent from multiple sides because often you're starting in the middle of a parking lot. They've got to be flexible. They need to change over time. They have to be financeable with what financing systems are left and they have to be replicable, which in our case means that all our designs are open source and we use simple construction methods. We start with just these simple things like these four room houses, whether they're all on the ground floor or they're two up, two down. These basic units are great around a motor court or a garden as you've seen from some of the previous slides from Canaan. Um, we've also got the micro retail, whether it's micro retail you can pick up and move around or whether it's fixed. These are the kind of things where literally someone could pay rent that's less than your cell phone bill and get a business started. And these can be either freestanding or embedded in existing buildings. This uh, single story retail is a critical type. It's a great way to line parking lots. It's, uh, this design here is done by Steve Muzan that shows how elegant just a simple one story building can be and how flexible. One thing we're really excited about is the market shed. It's just a simple steel truss building. It could also be timber frame for a little bit more. But it's a building you can put up very quickly at very little expense, and it immediately creates commercial opportunities for a variety of retailers. <laughs> and we're showing the price on these, these uh, buildings because we think it's so important that we begin to talk immediately about what these buildings cost and what it takes to get them done. And we're not saying these are beautiful buildings, and so therefore you must build them. We're saying these are the kind of things that really are affordable. Um, you can, after you've built your market shed, you can put walls around it, or even from the beginning, you can put walls around it and put a facade, and it, it becomes a great live work unit, a great shop space. It can become the lowest of the low building or it can be a great boutique. This is another building done by Steve Muzan and he, he developed this type after Katrina, after a hurricane. He had to come in quickly and reestablish commercial life and that was a, man, a uh, natural disaster and sprawl is more of a slow occurring man-made disaster we're trying to recover from and so we need to use some of those same tools about you know how do we create a live work building that's got some integrity and will begin to heal our city. We're also looking a lot at Quonset huts. It's basically, you know, a corrugated metal pipe. It's a, this is what the CBs use when they needed to build an air base in 15 minutes at Iwo Jima. They just go in, get them up real quickly, and so they're a great type and, uh, you know, very, very affordable, very flexible. With the work on the facade can be um, as elaborate as you want, and over time it can become better. A lot of spaces we're looking at are actually embedding loft spaces within existing commercial strip buildings like big boxes. You know, it's, it's uh, the... Uh, Sprawl doesn't have a lot of multi-story uh, masonry, big loft spaces, but we can go into old bowling alleys and car dealerships and create these spaces. The other thing we can do is sort of uh, cut a passageway into an existing building. We can cut through it. This is useful sometimes. If you need to bring a utility line through an existing building, just cut a little passage and line it with shops or lofts. This is the uh, 4F fourplex by Anderson Kim. This got, comes with a warning sticker. It's mixed use, which, you know, in CNU, you get a gold star. If you go to your lender, they treat it like, well, it's in the floodplain. It's just complicated. <laughs> and we've done one of those, but, you know, it's not what we prefer to do. So be cautious with this. 
but it's great to be able to be, do a small scale mixed use building. This is a mixed use liner building. This has also got the warning sticker and it's, it's similar to the 4F. The only difference is it's more elongated to serve more as a liner and it doesn't meet FHA um, financing regulations, but it is a, a very useful type. This is the backed and stacked eight plex. This, this warning sticker is because this is sort of the sprawl type. Like this is the garden apartment type. And the reason we're engaging with it is because we think affordability is so important that we're going to have to take some of these types that have typically been sprawl types, pretty mundane buildings, and try to find a way to, to work with them in our work because you know, we need that, in, that, uh, that lower price point. This is a breezeway liner building. This is a great building that you can put in front of an existing building. If you're trying to keep the, the other building, you still need to use it. You still need access to it. The breezeway screen, screens it, but it also allows access through it. We look at a lot of courtyard types. These are good because we sort of create instant civilization. We've got a sheltered microclimate where things can happen and uh, people can actually sit outside and drink a glass of wine in the sprawl. This is a real quick drawing of what could happen if you take some existing, an existing building, cut some lofts into it, add some of the uh, aplex units and a breezeway liner, and it creates that courtyard where people can mingle and gather. It creates the, the basic increment of urbanism, which is space between buildings, these well-defined spaces. And then I'll end with this, uh, you know, how do, what do you do with the worn out food, fast food outlet? This is the uh, defunct burger doodle or the taco tico, and it's, uh, you know, it's not the, the one that's doing well, it's the one that was really, you know, should have been closed down 20 years ago. But the, uh, the opportunity here is, you know, they've got a commercial kitchen, an existing hood, a grease trap, you know, it's got about $50,000 worth of assets hidden in it behind that ugly shell. And so the idea is to uh, add some single-story buildings, create a courtyard, and bring together someone like a wedding planner that's working out of her spare bedroom and going crazy, or somebody that's doing coffee roasting in an industrial space, or you know, someone brewing beer in their garage, and getting those people all in one place and so you can begin to create some momentum. And the key here with this you know, really simple building is that you can then expand this building on four sides. This is not the end condition. This is that first move to get things moving. We are actually a few minutes ahead of schedule, so I wanted to give a chance for uh, one or two questions for our first four speakers. Anybody, uh, anybody have a question for one of our first four speakers? Well, then we can go right on to Steve's talk. How do I make this full screen? Control L. Thank you. There we go. All right, this is a new idea that I've been working with actually, well, for some time. I used to call it pedestrian propulsion. Uh, but kind of crowdsourced a new title, and in, in, uh, Rob Studable is the one that came up with the, uh, with the new one. And uh, basically, here's the idea. Uh, you know, we talk about the quarter mile radius like it's some kind of a fixed thing, uh, it, and actually it's determined all sorts of things uh, over the years. But in reality, it's really a blunt instrument. Uh, it depends on where you are. Like, for example, here at a, at a power center, as is, is we all know, uh, you know, nobody will, if they come out of a, an old Navy, nobody will ever walk over to, to Best Buy. What you do is you, you jump in your car, you drive as close as possible to the front door of Best Buy, and then that's where you park. You might even wait three or four minutes for somebody to pull out of a parking space before having to walk five spaces further, not because you're lazy, but because the pedestrian experience is so dreadful. So in a, uh, uh, in, in a power center, your actual walking radius is much shorter than the quarter mile like you see here. Over here in Rome, uh, this is the Piazza del Popolo and Vittorio Emanuele is over there. Here's the quarter mile radius. People regularly walk uh, from here to there and they keep on walking uh, because it's such a great pedestrian experience. So, so really we need, to, we need to think about what kind of place we're creating uh, to do this. Uh, there's several things that, that contribute to walk appeal. Uh, for example, how often do you change the view? Uh, if, if someone, if the view changes very infrequently, you're boring the pedestrians, okay? So the further back a building is from the street, uh, the longer it takes to change the view uh, because you're steadily seeing that same view for a long time. Or uh, the, 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 the wider the, uh, the property is, then the less frequently it changes as well. 
And uh, of course, obviously the street enclosure is a big deal. We've, you know, these are things that we actually all know. Uh, I, I really shouldn't even spend that much time uh, on these. The one thing that I can't, now all of this stuff that down to here, uh, we can quantify. We can say it takes this much of that. You know, you need 69% of glass at eye level or whatever uh, to be interesting enough. Uh, for example, the, the, the last two, uh, I actually can't quantify, uh, especially the last one. The idea being that, that if, you, if you think that there's something out there that you need to go explore, uh, then that'll be a much more interesting thing, uh, interesting place to walk than a place like Sprawl where you know everything about it like the back of your hand. There's no reason to explore Sprawl. So, Here's what I'm proposing as the standard. The, the, the highest standard is what I'm calling the London standard. It could be Rome, it could be Paris, whatever. But that's where I'm suggesting that, that in, in an awesome streetscape, people will walk up to two miles. Uh, but Well, idiots like me will walk a lot further than that. But regular people will walk up to two miles before they actually get in the car and drive. Uh, and, and so that, this gets the, the, the green rating. Then uh, a, a really good main street, uh, or a typical main street, let's say, doesn't have to be awesome, uh, we'll get about three quarters of a mile. Incidentally, this, this explains the whole Australian uh, elongated pedestrian shed. You know, it, it's just a product of, of good walk appeal along that one street. Now, T4 is actually where the quarter mile radius occurs. You know, that's where people will walk about that far uh, before they're going to drive. So that is an accurate metric at that setting. T3, where the buildings are further apart and the further back, you're not changing the views as frequently. Uh, you're starting to bore the pedestrians. Uh, they won't walk nearly that far. At this point, in T3, they're going to walk about a tenth of a mile. And there's huge implications on this that everybody can imagine on, on uh, how much T3 you have and where you put it. Uh, and then the next step down is a subdivision street. Here, people will walk, and you notice that the, the colors are getting progressively redder. Uh, here, the, the people will walk about 250 feet. You know, in 50-foot lots, they'll walk about five houses down, and that's about it. Uh, and then you get into the really bad stuff, the power center we're talking about. Uh, they'll walk about 100 feet. This is almost totally red. The worst possible condition is where the sidewalk is between parking and an arterial. Uh, and here, I, I put a number of 25 feet on it, but in reality, the only way you'll even walk there at all is if your car breaks down. So let's take a look real quick uh, at, at uh, a place that a lot of people are familiar with. This is, this is St. Charles, Missouri. If anybody's been to Newtown, you've probably been to St. Charles as well. They have a great Main Street. It, it really is a classic. Uh, and, and so uh, it gives the, uh, the, the, the T5 rating. Uh, the yellow, of course, is the T4. And so what I've done is I've gone out here uh, and, and just simply used the metric. I said, OK, uh, when you go from here, let's, let's take a potential store right there. This is what everything is measured from. When you go from here to here, you've used a certain percentage of your walking radius at, at, the, T5, uh, at, at, at the T5 level of walk appeal. Then you turn down the side street. Uh, onto T4, and then you use up the rest of it, but at this point you run out, and that's as far as you can walk. Uh, but, but so what happens is, is a good T5 street uh, is going to extend everything in one direction, uh, just simply because people walk further in that direction. So there's also huge implications as well. You notice a lot of places here that, that, that where they have just one bad pedestrian experience. You know, the, the, the uh, parking behind the, uh, the sidewalk, and it kills it almost instantly. So you have this area up in here, they really should be uh, part of the best part of the town center, uh, and it actually is, is a dreadful part. And, and so what I've done in this next image is I said, okay, what if we just simply took what each of these parts of the town should have been uh, and, and, and healed them so that, so that you don't have all the, the dreadful parts. Uh, so here's the, the, the T5 portions mm -hmm. and then the T4. Look how many more potential customers you have, mm -hmm. okay? This is huge for economic development because what it says is basically that, that uh, uh, you know, if you can't get the customers there, then the, uh, then the neighborhood business is, uh, is, is uh, not going to happen. Here what I've done is I've said, well, let's dream a little bit. What happens if we take uh, and, and do the, the London standard, turn what, would it, what was T5 into the London standard? Uh, and then a lot of the T4 actually grows into T5 incrementally over time. Uh, and then that, look how many more customers you can reach. You know, it, it really makes all the difference in, in uh, between whether something works or not. And that's what I've got. Thank you. All right, I think you're up, Frank. Great. So I walked from the airport to the Marriott hotel and 
I walked along a bridge that I think no mankind had ever walked along. <laughs> it's a good experience. So I'm going to talk about the retrofit service, and I think the retrofit service gets really exciting when it's merged with the incremental sprawl repair. Um, it's a CNT innovation. It would be the nation's first one-stop wet weather retrofit or retrofit service for communities. The idea is it would reduce property flooding and reduce stormwater to runoff. I'm going to talk about why it matters, what it is, will it work, and its significance. Uh, I uh, direct the water program at CNT, um, so we're all about urban sustainability. We have a broad range of programs and a track record in innovation with two not-for-profit ventures. So why does it matter? Um, I've heard quite a lot about new urbanism equals making people's lives better. I was particularly interested in what does bad look like? What does it feel like to the public? Because unless you've got an understanding of that, you can't really understand whether or not you're making their life better. Um, we started this new initiative called Smart Water for Smart Regions, in which we're doing that. We're working with communities across eight Great Lakes states and various national um, partners. And the first bad that we discovered and have decided to focus on is routine property flooding. Um, and I'm not talking about the overbank areas. I'm talking about the, just the regular flooding that happens all the time. I've been working with someone who's been working in CNT for a very, very long time, and he was shocked, really, by the uh, nature of the interviews that we started to do with people who had routine property flooding. Elizabeth Rafferty, for example, has been flooded four times in two years, $75,000 worth of damage. She's been dropped by the insurance companies. Her son suffers from an asthma attack, and she's had an infestation of horse flies. It's really gruesome. And then the more research we did, the more gruesomeness we discovered. So in the Chicago region, we found uh, companies who do permaseal, they do the, the water basement sealing, and they reckon that one in four properties in various um, communities are affected. It particularly affects people on low income because they can't really afford any of the measures uh, to help solve the problem. It has huge economic and health impacts. And people from our interviews were frankly angry and anxious which is a good way of getting people mobilized for change. So for me, that's exciting, um, not for them. Uh, we found in the Great Lakes, we did a survey of 28 largest water utilities. 80% had medium or high flooding problems in the communities they serve. All of them were suffering from routine property flooding. So it's not the just the Chicago region. So what's the wet tray pit service? Well, the point is it's a whole neighborhood approach. You would go in and do a whole neighborhood assessment um, and then target the priority areas and do more specific um, audits of individual properties. So although you go, the municipality is the main client, you would then offer the service to the property owners. Those property owners could be residential, um, businesses, but also public buildings, schools, churches, etc. So the municipality would pay for the assessments and the property owners pay for the measures that would be put in their home or property. So it's really all about coordination. It's about coordinating across multiple properties and about coordinating private sector suppliers who then put in the measures to relieve the flooding. But it's also got a very strong... We can't do this if it doesn't have a very strong community element to it because you just wouldn't get enough people participating. So it's, all, it's very much about training up neighbourhood leaders to, um, to help solve the problems themselves. So this is the kind of um, the one-stop model. You can see aggregated demand uh, and aggregated supply. And the point is that the solutions would be tailor-made. So it's about disconnecting downspouts, street retrofitting, bias rails, rain gardens, etc. So will it work? Um, we have done quite a lot of market research, and we've been working with, um, well, we've been doing lots and lots of surveys. Um, and there seems to be a very large identifiable market, so both municipalities seem to be very interested and householders. Um, and they, are, they also have quite a lot of money because they have a, a, a very expensive problem at the moment. Um, the insurance companies are interested and are working with us to release data on what they're currently paying, uh, as is FEMA. Um, there are low operational costs. It's, it's about coordination. Um, and lots of eager, eager private sector suppliers, limited competition. So in theory, yes, but we do need to do more testing and research. So our plan is to launch it at the end of 2013. I'm excited not only because I see it, you know, we talk a lot about social justice. I really think property flooding is a serious social justice problem. You know, it's, it's awful. 
Um, and, but also I'm excited because we found people arguing for green infrastructure in a way they would never have before if we just talked about stormwater management and green infrastructure. We have got people really angry and, and dying for change. So, so these people will argue for the change, that they, for something they wouldn't normally be motivated to do. So if you're interested in any way, contact me. So unfortunately, our last speaker has been uh, caught in a car accident on the highway, and so um, he seems to be fine and is going to try to get here, but may not uh, make it in time. Um, but that, that's, that's the rest of our speakers up to this point. So I wonder if I could get all of our speakers to come up at the front um, and just pull some chairs up and we can have a little discussion uh, with the rest of our time. And I can pull this down. We can, I don't think we can pass it all the way down, actually. It's not um, wireless. But I was really interested in the relationship between the walk appeal and the sprawl retrofit and wondered if, if anyone else was sort of noticing those connections and wanted to comment on that. Actually, I, I have a kind of a, kind of a branched off uh, thing uh, going on right now with what I'm calling a 12-step a, a program for sprawl recovery. It, it has been an addiction after all. And, and Walk Appeal is one of three what I call game changers, uh, the, uh, the transect being another one, uh, and, and then the sky method being the third one uh, that, that actually make that happen. So, so I, I kind of think that a lot of what we're, basically everything that these guys were doing would, would plug right into the framework of what I'm doing. So we're all, we're all actually kind of collaborating at different levels in a way that, that, that could be really, really fascinating to see here in another few months or so. Yeah, we, we were, can you hear me? Is this on? Is that one not on? We're just talking about it. Okay. Basically, we were, we were uh, hoping that... Oh. Okay. Now? Yes. Okay. Um, we were hoping Steve would, Steve would talk a little bit about the SKY method because it does dovetail even more closely with what we're talking about, about incremental change over time, creating great urban environments. And so the certainly, you know, the walk appeal and... Um, is, is closely related to that, and the tranks effect is closely related to that. But particularly that just that concept that you know the real estate economy has crashed, and thank goodness that you know it's going to we're all going to be better for it. We have any questions or comments from um, folks in the room? Yeah. I think you know, this is a dumb zone, but I think what we need to do is focus on, on sort of a, a matrix of cone avoidance and avoidance of the because. A matrix of code avoidance. Code avoidance. I'm going to repeat what people say just so it gets on the recording. So, go ahead. <laughs> but sprawl repair are fabulous, and, and the graphics you showed are fabulous. But when code comes to bear and we have to deal with life safety, and people start saying we have to sprinkle these sand buildings, and if they're up for more than 180 days, it's not a sense of temporary building and so forth, and they want, you know, uh, scrub life safety scrub, so forth, in, in these small buildings, something's wrong. There are great ways around it, and obviously it's state by state, has an impact. But I think we need to be really smart, smart maybe with Galena and Galena Lee, um, she could start it. But we need to be smart about how to do this. I mean, for example, Massachusetts, it's, it's absolutely horrific. And we had to fight this badly for 250 and 350 square foot commercial spaces. And, and get innovative about doing it. But I, I think we all get tired trying to do it individually. And maybe you guys who are the smarter ones, and Steve, you could do it. Um, figure out a matrix of how to enable us to build these smaller, sprawl repair spaces and avoid the idiocy of building codes that, that raise that per square foot number dramatically. So how do, how do we deal with the sprawl retrofit without being killed by the building codes? Well, really good the, 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 yeah, the... the, the <laughs> The building code has its own language in there about when you're retrofitting, they have very specific thresholds of what you have to meet. And the key is to understand those thresholds and not trigger them. I, I, I don't think, I think code avoidance is, um, my heart is there, I, my uh, professional license is not. So I think that, you know, I'd like to, what, what, and the key is, 
you know, you can do, you can uh, do things incrementally and meet the different code barriers and not trigger, see, you, you might make a, a decision based on not triggering a sprinkler system or something like that. And it's, it's part of the game. The game is more complex than, you know, simple new buildings. Is what I'd say. I just wanted to add to that in terms of, you know, the single family product that we've been looking at and investigating, the two specific issues that we run into are the, the side setbacks and it becomes an issue of maintenance and security. And the Florida Building Code allows a six foot separation between the buildings. So you can actually have three feet uh, in between the lot line and the property. There hasn't been one municipality or county that we have found that will let us actually build to that six foot line. Not one, and uh, we've we've made the argument with a couple of them, and uh, we actually got Pasco County uh, to let us go down to four foot side yard setbacks, but uh, we haven't gotten to the three foot yet. But we're working on it. And of course, you know, in terms of the other codes that we run into with the skinnier streets, which we all applaud, it's they don't accommodate you know the biggest fire engine. They're all the, the fire uh, the fire chief needs to have his street designed for the biggest fire engine. And it's just it's kind of crazy. So we've got a we've got a lot of work to do with that. One thing I, I was on a, uh, I was a consultant on a trip with Canaan uh, this well a few months ago whenever it was and and one one of the, the studies that it did as part of the charrette was, was uh, to look at what would happen if at least a part of the urbanism had only neighborhood electric vehicles. Now, if nothing about the house footprint changes and nothing about even the side yard setbacks change, but only, the only things that change are, are all of the geometry implications of regular cars versus neighborhood electric vehicles, uh, you get literally almost precisely twice as many units on the same piece of land. Uh, it was absolutely shocking. I knew it would be more. I didn't know it would be that much more. But that, that's another tool that ought to be in the toolbox. Are there, are there specific problems you've run into in terms of the codes with doing retrofit that you're oh, thinking of? So how can you retrofit before they hit rock bottom? Yeah, how can you retrofit? How can you convince them to retrofit? Well, I, I, I think you're seeing a bit of a change as well. I mean, I'll use the example in Orlando of uh, Fashion Square Mall. Uh, you may not realize it, but the, the well, now it's up for sale, of course, but the owners of that mall have actually done a very elaborate uh, retrofit plan that includes uh, housing, it includes reworking some of the circulation and all of that kind of thing. Uh, and it's Pennsylvania Real Estate Trust. I mean, they, they own properties all over the nation. And so they're starting to see that their parking lot is not really a money-making asset. And so how can they change it into something that's really working? So uh, hopefully even corporate America is starting to realize that asphalt doesn't make money. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, though, that, that, that really uh, – Desperation allows a lot of things to happen that, that can't happen in, in flush times. And so that desperation may include the, the first owner of the building no longer owning it. And, and so all sorts of things are possible. When that happens, unfortunately, you have to go through, through the dip uh, to get there. And, and, I mean, but that's, easy. that's the easy answer is just, yeah, let them fail and then we'll clean up the mess. It, it's just like drug addiction, right? <laughs> well, I just like to sprawl down uh, other questions and comments? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about the, uh, the retrofit building types and specifically the single story retail. Um, are there examples of where that, that building type at $80 a foot had been, has been built? Because I've got some great places for them. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, 
the key to doing micro retail affordably is that instead of a bathroom, you give them a sign that says back in 10 minutes, put on the door. <laughs> that's, that's the, it's the, uh, you can build these spaces cheaply if you don't, if it's not like this is a big store shrunk down. It's like this is a different animal and it's got, they've got to be very good friends with the coffee shop across the way to make it work. But the, um, we're seeing, what we're seeing in micro retail, most of it's naturally occurring micro retail and not specifically built. And I took those numbers from other pro similar projects <laughs> I was doing, but we are, we're not currently building one of those micro retailers yet. Well, the, you had the single story shop front? Yes. That uh, looked like it was maybe a little bit step up from the micro retail? Yes, uh, yes, yeah. And, and that had uh, the, the shared bathroom and the, or the yeah. yeah. And, and, and are those prices per foot sort of what they were is a uh, is Will Dowdy here or David Kim? okay Will do you want to answer that question about the pricing of the you did a, you did that taxpayer building that had yeah, the that, and that was based on um, the construction estimate that we worked with the contractor um, on on a couple of different things so um, so it, it's just a ballpark number it's not yeah. based on, on building one but um, I would actually uh, kind of full full circle I'd say Matt Collins has some of the very best that I've ever seen. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Mashby Commons. Uh -huh. um, it's the the uh, um, they're, 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 it's, I believe it was the project you were referring to. It was um, it's the parking lot. It's the screens parking lot. It uh, plays one side of the street uh, very convincingly. Um, it's they're small. They've got funky shops in there, and um, and, and it's, it's really worth. There's a lot of great things about Mashby Commons, and I would say that's one of the very best. Yeah, the other fancy. And it's also a very desirable location. Well, it's become a desirable location. I mean, yeah. well, those, those are also the highest level in retail in Mashby Commons. They pay the highest rent. Per square foot. Per square foot. Yeah. I mean, they're not rent. But uh, Will's firm also designed a little office building that was designed from the furniture out. Like it did, they figured out how many cubicles and conference rooms and corner offices, and then that became the the space, just like what uh, Greg was talking about. So that's the uh, these people are just having to be more creative. And but the numbers, I mean, I think the numbers are real. We're building these, you know, we're getting gotten prices on these buildings that are that are real. We, there's a, there's a lot of discussion right now, you know, about the fact that we are overbuilt with retail, but it's the wrong kind of retail. And how, when we're overbuilt with retail, how do we go back to the right kind of retail affordably? And it just seems like there's, there's a lot of answers there that can be pulled off, and we can get a couple of good examples of that. Mm. One, one thing to think about, how many architects in the room? Okay, so fair number. All right, yeah, and, uh, and that is that because of the fact that most states have a, uh, a lower end uh, at which point you have to be a licensed architect in that state to do commercial work. Like in my, originally I was from Alabama, the limit there was 2,500 feet. I don't know what it is in other places. But because of that, uh, it, everybody here should actually do uh, a few uh, one-story liner buildings that are just pure commercial, some two-story liner buildings that are apartment above. Uh, you should do a few MUSE units. You, you should look into some of these other types and have it as a part of your portfolio of stock plans uh, because we really need more than uh, there's a few of us that have done that uh, you know that Robert showed a couple of mine but but really we, we need more out there and so consider doing that uh, sometime in the next year I see a question over there yeah yeah I have a comment and then a question um, back on the subject of code avoidance that's what the term was um, my background is aviation safety and I got frustrated with all the competing non-integrated theories of safety out there and, and decided to turn to philosophy as an integration mechanism. Um, very disappointed about that. So now I'm on to religion. <laughs> but one, one thing I learned in that process is that uh, there are some very real risks to the public that the codes are trying to address. And what I found working with a homeless encampment under a bridge just outside of the town I live in, um, a concern about open defecation and fecal coliform count in the river, uh, and, and dealing with the state level um, uh, health and environmental control and the county level, it, is that um, it's helpful to get specific 
about the risk because the codes are quite generalized. And so if you specify the risks according to exactly what you're trying to do um, and then show how you're managing those risks, I think that's something that can communicate to um, the, the uh, public uh, servants who are over that. And, and what I'm looking at is, is state legislation that, that we need to write to accommodate this kind of risk. Um, and then my question is, um, Steve, could you elaborate on the SKY method? Um, one of the reasons I'm here is because of Frank Starkey's um, recorded presentation at the University of Miami where he's talking about the, the new way of doing development. And, and he specifically mentions Eric Moser's um, component type of house in the SKY method. And, and I understood that differently, I think, than maybe it's being talked about here. Could you give a brief overview of that? Yeah, or briefly what it amounts to, it, well, first of all, it, it's the only method I'm aware of that, that doesn't involve having anybody having to buy any land. So there doesn't have to be a master developer that, that comes in and buys the land. What happens is that at whatever point you are, uh, you know, it, 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 if, you know, just a, re a regular subdivision, undifferentiated uh, uh, residential or whatever it might be, the idea is that, that uh, you code uh, certain streets or street frontages, you code by the street frontage to either, uh, to whatever transect zone uh, would be the, the imagined climax condition at some future point, it doesn't matter when. I mean, it could be, you can say, this, it might take 200 years, okay? But, but you say, well, this, someday this, this should be T5. And then what happens is, uh, if someone wants to upgrade from the current condition to the next transect zone, uh, then they pay an upgrade fee, uh, and, and then uh, the, the developer or city or, or uh, if there is a developer involved, uh, it, in the case of Spro, I'm sorry? Town founder, yeah, whoever the the, the uh, administering uh, entity is, uh, if they, th th it's their responsibility with a part of that upgrade fee to uh, uh, to to actually upgrade the infrastructure as well to support the the next fast transit zone, and then. Uh, so what that amounts to is, is that the the person that profits the most is the landowner. Okay, so the nimbyism kind of goes away, uh, and, and uh, because everybody everybody that lives there is a partner in the future development of the place, uh, and and so it, it's something that that uh, and it allows everything to be done incrementally in tiny little steps. And really, if you look back at, at say a map of, of Boston from uh, 250 years ago, what you find is that Beacon Hill was, uh, or maybe 300, I can't remember, but Beacon Hill was basically a bunch of family farms that subdivided into what it was. Pienza, I, shockingly, I, I was in Pienza last fall, presentation by a local uh, uh, historian who showed that it, originally, 2,000 years ago, Pienza was a large lot Roman subdivision of about one acre each. And, and those acres, through many, many, many incremental subdivisions over the years, uh, has turned into what it is today. Uh, and basically, each of, the, each of the lots has become a block. You know, and, and, uh, but it's just absolutely fascinating to watch that process of that happening. That, so that actually is the bigger story uh, than the humanist pope, you know, when it comes to, to Pienza in my mind. Well, and, and the discussion here then is about retrofitting that in an existing neighborhood? Yeah, it's basically about how do you start with existing sprawl, whether it's uh, strip centers or subdivisions, or, you know, all the components of sprawl, uh, you know, office parks and all this and have them incrementally in little steps, many, many little steps, many hands involved, uh, to, to turn that from, from its wretched current state uh, into something wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Wanda.
furnishings in the uh, room they want. And so she says, Dad, I need your help. I want to move this desk out into the hall. And he goes, why do you want to do that? She says, because I just I want to move it out into the hall. I need to get this out of here. He goes, OK. And so they move it out. And he happens to notice all these desks out in the hall. <laughs> and he inquires, why is everybody putting their desk out in the hall? And they said, well, because we don't have to keep anything we don't want. And none of us use desks. And because this little bit of young generation that has grown up with these laptops, where they basically sit and do their work on their bed, or uh, you know, out on the park bench, or the you know, socializing. I mean, it's just, they've grown up without using desks, and and so that was a lesson to this man who his whole business was giving everybody a desk. <laughs> so um, you know, that may be something as, as you know. Way we live now, whether it's a work or whatever the situation is, as it's so, sort of changing, um, that may be the very thing that helps us to retrofit. Where you suddenly realize these big, for example, office parks, everybody doesn't need a desk, so you can so change that standard paradigm there. And you know, we saw some statistics about the shrinking home size. But you can see the exact same kind of statistics in the space per office worker numbers. Now we just have to work on the uh, parking lot ratio requirements for office as well. In fact, in, all, in most office buildings now, the space per office worker is less than the space per car. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The other thing about sprawl is you mentioned sort of you have to wait till it hit rock, hits rock bottom. One of the interesting phenomena to me is that some pieces will hit rock bottom while other pieces are healthy. For example, you might have an office campus that's doing pretty well and has a lot of jobs. And so this, what the Resprawl or Retrofit lets you do is build new housing and new businesses close to those already existing economic generators. Even though we maybe wouldn't try to create office campuses, we can take some advantage of their economic vitality and the reality that they are on the ground at this moment. And so we just getting, just getting people's commuting time cut in half is, is a valid thing to do. It is sort of a hybrid intermediate position, which is what we advocate. One thing, you, you mentioned parking uh, ratios just a moment ago. Uh, a real silver bullet for, for parking, for cross usage of parking uh, is walk appeal. I mean, if people will walk a much greater distance, then you get all sorts of cross usage that will occur that would not occur uh, if they'll only just walk out the door. green scorecard that works at, at three levels at the level of, of the uh, uh, of, of the building uh, for a green building rating system and the level of the neighborhood and then at the level of the city uh, and, and at the level of the neighborhood it, it specific it I'm trying to figure out the mechanism yeah. I've got it part way figured out uh, for actually for, for actually doing that under the hood where uh, but the whole idea is the user shouldn't have to uh, to know anything about what goes on under the hood that is put in the basic metrics uh, and then the thing calculates it, and and so uh, wish me luck. <laughs> the preliminary encouragement, that's one of the, as you might probably know, one of the huge weaknesses of lock score. Yeah. Yeah. Is that it just doesn't take into account the quality of the right. Right. And, all, right. so. and that's that's what this will do. But basically what it would be, uh, if I can ever finish it, 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 
uh, it, it, is it will end up being a stealth code because if you put your your uh, current condition in there and it, it's a pretty wretched rating and you say, well, what if I turn this dial? Oh, that's better. Okay, I have to, you know, let's, let me turn this. And then you, you, you adjust the dials and then all, all of a sudden you see what you should be. And, and so that's the real intent is, is it to be a code by enticement, if you will. Mm -hmm. Steve, have you heard Ian Rasmussen talk about his uh, video game theory of urbanism? Actually, I haven't. We so, talk this evening. so I'll He's just here, explain right? it briefly okay. because it, I think it's a really cool idea and it fits in with your walk appeal. Yeah. The video game is the goal is to get the most amenities within a certain time period of where you are. So I'm in this location and I want to get the most amenities possible within 15 minutes. If you assume that that person is walking, what you're going to do to get those amenities within 15 minutes is totally the opposite of if you assume that that person is driving. One thing I can think of that might step towards it is that we can do asphalt surveys from certain aerial photography that are reasonably accurate, and that's the best measure I can think of that might approximate what you're talking about. Well, and there's also, like in, in Google Maps, there's a, uh, you can pretty well determine property lines. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so that tells you, you the width of property properties. And uh, so there, there are some things to be in mind there. Yeah. How about other questions and comments? One thing about, uh, I will say, and that is that it, uh, if you look at uh, objections to, a, to a, a, a system or a technique or whatever at, at the, the macro level and say, well, what would prevent this from working, you know, anywhere in the world, then, then almost everything becomes impossible. But the more localized you look at it, the more things become possible. And, and, and so uh, just as a, as a general rule. We have just a couple minutes left, so I want to give everyone uh, on our panel a shot to, you know, make one last comment. I've made too many already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I put you on the spot. <laughs> I want to hear more about this retrofit stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to add. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I was excited by the incremental spool repair, and I think, I think there's a tie in there. I think the the, the nature of getting people mobilized to change their spaces is what uh, excites me about it. I have a question for you, Harriet. The, um, you talked about doing a neighborhood assessment, but then the, the interventions you do, can those be done on an incremental basis for the wetrofit? Or does it have to be a kind of comprehensive neighborhood wetrofit? Um, so I think you target the priority areas and then what we were thinking of, you know, like the Tupperware parties, but in this case it would be kind of, you know, neighbours getting together to agree to do a neighbourhood blitz. Mm. So, I mean, we're, we're testing it currently with rain gardens where we're getting community meetings and then they're doing mass rain garden sessions. I guess with the, with the site improvement um, methods that I talked about, you know, most of those 
things that that I came up with. You can go to the older neighborhoods um, anywhere in the United States and, and and find most of them, and and those are probably probably the way that we used to do things before all the engineers got together, all the solid waste guys got together, and and came up with their their own ideas for exactly what what th what they needed. And I, I think that's really what what wound up, you know. Um, creating the gold-plated infrastructure um, that, that you see in, in most of sprawl and most of the infrastructure that's required by the cities now. Um, you know, so if we could just go back to, to the way we did things before um, where it was a more balanced approach, then I think we'd find that we could, we could save a lot of, of uh, wasted expense. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying many of the Maybe what I can do is help uh, express kind of the framework uh, that incremental sprawl repair looks at things through. Uh, clearly, you can go out and we can uh, chide sprawl, and we can also, you know, open up uh, very wonderful sprawl repair books and see beautiful images. Um, but I think that incremental sprawl repair kind of lives in that framework of the Frankenstein, you know, the hybrid, that, that, that space and transition. And so from that point of view, many of these techniques and things like that uh, really changes the way you look and see things. Um, so yeah, thank you. Well, I want to thank our speakers and thank Eliza Harris for organizing this um, session. And um, this was an experiment at CNU, this sort of format. If you enjoyed it, I encourage you to say so on your um, evaluation forms that someone will email to you sometime after the Congress. So thanks, everyone.